Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. you today. I want to welcome those who are joining us online. Thank you for being part of what we're doing. We're in a two-part series. This is part two uh, where we're talking about baptism. Uh, we looked at communion last weekend, both kind of going into Easter, the most important day of the year. <clears throat> it's really the most important event that's ever happened. All time kind of revolves around Jesus being raised from the dead. So before we get into today's message, I want to ask you to do three things with me this week. Okay, this week to prepare for Easter, because it is the most important time. Number one is I would like you to pray with me. <clears throat> and I know that uh, you might be thinking, oh, you know, you're a pastor, that's what you're expected to say, but I'm serious. I mean, prayer makes a big difference. I want people, when they come, Next weekend, to not experience church, I want them to experience Christ. I want them to experience the power and the love of Christ. And the uh, and, you know, Bible says that our minds are blinded. They're like, there's like a cover over them before Christ. And Jesus sheds light on that and, re and takes that blinder off and, and allows us to see. That all happens not through you know, good programming and preaching. It happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that happens through prayer. So that's really important. Second thing is to invite. I want you to invite somebody. It really is an opportune time uh, to invite somebody to, to, uh, to Easter. So what we did was we, we have these, um, these uh, invite cards. Everybody should have one. You can take it out, right? If you don't have one, put your hand in there. But everybody should, it should have come in your program. At least humor me. Take, take it out, please. It's in your... <laughs> There you go, okay. <clears throat> there is a right way and a wrong way to invite somebody to church. You might not know that. So I just want to just let you know, here's the wrong way. You go up, you go, hey, you might need this. There you go, check it out. <laughs> That's the wrong way. The right way is you go up to somebody and you say, hey, this is my church, I'd like to invite you. I'll be going to, and you tell them which service you're going to, like the 9.30 service or the 11 o'clock. I'll be going to this service. I'd like to meet you. I'll wait for you and meet you in the lobby or the cafe or wherever you want to meet them and say, we'll sit together. Here, here's, I hope to see you there. See, that's the right way. And it's a real powerful thing when somebody gets invited to church because it's kind of scary, you know, a new church. You don't know what it's like, what the people are like. That changes it. Hey, I know somebody. They're going to be waiting for me. I'm going to get to sit with them. So inviting is big. And then lastly is to serve, to serve. I would like you to come and help us. This is your house. This is, we're going to have guests next week. We're the host. Please come and serve and you can serve during the week we have two times that we ask you to come you can you know any if you can only give us 15 minutes 30 minutes we have little projects that are that small we have bigger ones from on tuesday and thursday from five to nine this week to show up you'll be serving with other people get to meet some people and music some food it'll be a great f experience but we sure could help you to just kind of get our facility, get things ready for, for this Easter. And then another way you can serve is, as I mentioned earlier, for prayer. Uh, we have a prayer uh, on Wednesday night from 7 to 9, and then next Saturday at 9.30, 9.30 to 10.30. And we'll be praying specifically for Easter. If you're not sure how to pray, just come and join us. Just sit and just we'll be praying, and you can just kind of pray in your own way, okay? So that's certainly ways that you can serve. Another way you can serve is... Uh, is is come and serve one. We talk about worship one, serve one. You come and you serve one of the services. 
And, and if you're on the dream team, maybe you just say, hey, I'm, I know I'm not scheduled, but I'm, I'm here to help out. If you're not on the dream team, you've never taken growth track, you're not on the dream team, you can come next weekend and you can serve, okay? You can be a dream teamer for a day. Even though you didn't take growth track, even though you're officially not on, we'll invite you in, we'll say, hey, here's how you can serve, and you'll have a great time. So that's what I want you to do. Certainly, if you're part of the church and you see a new person, make them feel welcome. You go, how do I know they're new? Well, listen, I'll show you exactly what a new person looks like. Okay, that's what they look like. You see somebody doing that? They're new, okay? You just go on up and you say, hey, my name's Andy. Uh, so glad that you're here. I'm one of the, uh, this is my church. I'm one of the, the members here. I'm, how can I, is there any way I can help you? Yeah, I have youth. I'm not sure where they go. Let me take you with, let me show you. Let me take you there. Okay, don't just point. Just let me take you there and just make them feel comfortable, okay? So those are the three things that I'd like you to do for me is pray. We need prayer. We really do. We, 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 we need all hands on deck, right? And we need everybody to be part of what we're trying to accomplish. Certainly we need uh, not just prayer, but we need uh, you to, to invite people and then to serve. Now we're going to jump into today's message. You can take out your outline now. Okay, today's message, we're going to, the question we're going to answer is, is, or at least look at, is, is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does that look like? And you see, my guess is if we, I were to survey all of you here, survey those who are joining us online, I bet I would get many, many different answers, maybe as many answers as there are people. You go to different churches, and you'll get different responses of what, how to answer this question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? I mean, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to somebody else? What do other people think? What do churches think? What does Jesus think? I mean, certainly that would be good to know. What does Jesus think it means to be his follower? And so we're going we're gonna to talk about that. I think it's particularly important nowadays because, you know, that's actual, people have followers all the time, right, on social media, YouTube. You know, how many followers do you have? You know, in YouTube, there's actually a guy who leads the way above and beyond everybody else. His name's PewDiePie. He's got over 45, 44, uh, 94 million followers. People that, they're subs, live subs. And so there's a, a music company called T-Series that is actually about to catch him. But it's like a whole industry. It's a whole company trying to catch this one guy. Let me show you the, the live update. That's actually live. So it's 94,000. Oh, look, they, they, they caught him officially. As of yesterday, they hadn't. So it's going to go back and forth. But he's by himself, solo, leading the way with followers. So you can see it actually goes down sometimes because people like unfollow people. So that happens at YouTube, of course. Now, I don't really, I'm not a huge YouTuber. I'm more into Twitter. And so I want you to know my, this is a, a, a shameless <laughs> appeal to get you to follow me. Okay. At Andy Mead. And I, I like Twitter. You know, I mean, I, I do some tweets, but. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes I will unfollow somebody. The reason I'll unfollow them is, is that, you know, like they fill up my news feed, right? They tweet, 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 breath. Tweet, 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 tweet. And all I can see is there, I don't think, you know, I can't read everybody else's. And finally, if I get frustrated enough, right? Tweet, 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 tweet. I just unfollow. Bam. You're gone. And it's empowering. It kind of feels good. Like, woo, I got some power there. You know, have you ever done that? Just unfollow somebody and you just kind of, yeah. Well, listen, following Jesus is something different, okay? And Jesus talks about it a lot. We're going to look at one passage, and uh, I'd like you to, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to, to open it up. We're going to be looking specifically there at Mark chapter 8, and this is where it begins in verse 27. So here it says, Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around uh, this actually is important, Caesarea Philippi, that's, in the, that's a village in the northern a part of Israel, up where the Golan Heights are. You know that in the news lately, the Golan Heights, the United States has now recognized that as part of Israel. Well, that's where it's at, right up in that area. And um, 
there in Caesarea Philippi, even though this is the holy land, this is not a very holy place. It's a place of pagan idolatry, this pagan worship. Jesus takes them there to talk about this subject he's going to bring up. He says, hey, let's get out of the church or the synagogue. Let's get, uh, we're not going to go to the lake this time. We're going to go here and we're going to be surrounded with all of these pagan temples where people go and they, he goes, here's what the world is doing. Here's what the world has to offer. And in that context, he says this, he says, on their way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So this is a little odd because John the Baptist had just been beheaded. And Elijah died many, many years before that. So why would they say that? Well, some of the people believed in reincarnation at that time. So they're saying, hey, some people think you're just reincarnated of some prophet of old. And uh, he says, but what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Now, Peter actually gets it right. He says, he answered, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, which is the Messiah. So he gets it right technically, but in his mind, he's thinking something else. He's actually thinking, hey, we've been praying for this Messiah to come to break the back of the Romans. They're the ones that are, that are dominating Israel at the time. And he's thinking, he, he's thinking of an earthly Messiah, somebody who's going to come with power and might, and he's going to, he's going to overthrow all of those, those other countries. And Peter's probably thinking, and I get to be your chief of staff. You know, I'm going to get a promotion out of this deal. So Jesus, he understands it. He warns them not to tell anyone about him. He says, then he began to teach them what they need to know. He says, no, actually, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law. Well, this is certainly not what Peter was thinking. And, uh, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I think this is kind of interesting that Peter is rebuking Jesus. You know, I mean, you got to have some, you know, some guts, right, to rebuke. But notice that it says he only began. It didn't get very far. All right. Then he says, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. So that's kind of put him in his place, right? He says, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. This really is what discipleship is about. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. What are you have the things of God in mind? Is that what you're going after in life? Or are you doing the things of people, the things of men, of women? And he says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. He says, you know what? I'm going to get everybody around. Everybody come together. And he says this, if anyone, if anyone would come after me. Now, I paused it there because... That really is a key, that comma, what would you add in there? If anyone were to come after me, what would that require? What does that look like? That's kind of the answering the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? If anyone were to come after me, well, here's what he says. He says, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. He says, this is the key. He says, you have to do denial. And this is kind of like, would not make sense on the surface, right? It's almost counterintuitive. To, you have to deny yourself, and you have to be willing to, and he says, pick up the cross. The cross in that day, see, today, for the cross, when we think of a cross, we think of a little emblem or a tattoo or something, and, you know, it's real endearing, and it makes me have warm and fuzzy. I think about what Jesus did for me, and that's great, but that's not what they were thinking. In their mind, that was like, you know, the electric chair. They're thinking, it's a, a place of torture and execution. And he says, this is what it means. You're going to have to die. He says, for anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. He says, everybody dies. No matter what, everybody's going to die. And there's no way to change that. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. He goes, hey, that's how you're going to save your life is by following me. Everybody dies. Doctors die, right? Nutritionists, they die. People who eat organic, they die. They just die with a nasty taste in their mouth, right? <laughs> But everybody dies. Jesus says, hey, and some people are trying to cling to it, trying to, you know, they're trying to make their life something other than what it is. It's going to end up dying, he says. But listen, if you die and you, you recognize your life is about living for Christ, you're going to have, you're going to be living for something bigger than yourself. For eternity and your life will be different. What, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? He says, 
It really comes down to what you're living for. You know, what kind of aim do you have? If anyone is ashamed of me, Jesus goes on saying, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, he says, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So he says, he says there's, I mean, you either live for me or you don't. Sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, being a Christian is kind of a private thing. You know, I need to be private about it. Listen, that's not, that's not at all what Jesus says, right? That's, Jesus does, God says, I don't have secret agents. You know, it's about, being, it's about sharing your faith. In fact, Jesus says, be like a shining light on a hill. He wants, he wants you to share what you, you know. Uh, now, now, in Luke 9, this actually is the same story that Luke tells in his gospel, but he adds another word. He adds another word. Notice he says, then he said to them, this is Jesus, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross. Now, notice this is the key word, daily, and follow me, daily. So daily talks about like this, uh, the steps that you're taking. You're doing something daily. There's a progression to it. And there is a progression to it. Being a, you even see this with Jesus. And, and as he has people follow him, not everybody's following him with the same level of dedication. So, and, and you can see this all throughout the Bible. So let's look at this real quick because I think it, it, it really demonstrates where um, you kind of just find yourself where you're at on, on, on this, uh, on this uh, list of, of following him. First of all, so these are the five levels of following Christ. The first level, and, and really the key is, let me just say this, is, is identifying where you're at and taking the next step. First level is the crowd. Jesus spoke to the crowds. He would speak to the 5,000 when he was feeding them uh, you know, food. He would get all these people together when they were hungry. He would feed them all. I mean, he was speaking to the crowd. And when Jesus spoke to Peter, he, the, the verse we just read, that was later on. When he first connected with Peter, you know, he fed him. He, he, Peter was just fishing. He wasn't a follower of Jesus at the time. And so he speaks to Peter in the crowd, and he just fills his boat up with fish. Peter goes, this is awesome. Well, dang, man, I'm going to follow that guy. So really the crowd is, is this come and see. Come and see and experience, uh, experience what God has for you. And that's the kind of environment we try to, pro try to provide, this appealing environment, attractional environment on a weekend service. People just come and see. Grab a cup of coffee, a bagel. We'll watch your kids. We have some, some good music. Some, we have some fun, some jokes. This, and we're trying to create a place where, hey, just come and see what it's about. Come and see what it's about. This is the first level. Then you have the congregation. This is another step. This is saying, hey, I want to be part of this. So it's come and join us. Come and join us. This is the congregation where you say, hey, I want to go to the next level. I don't want to just stay as a crowd. I like what God, I like this, you know, I like how God's doing something in this church. And that would be like saying, I want to be part of the family, you know. And so the way you experience family in, in, in our church is in small groups. Small groups, you get in a small group, you can, you can just be real. You can, we, help, uh, we help walk out our faith step free from habits and things that are holding us back, maybe uh, uh, areas where we couldn't have been ourselves. And this is a real powerful thing where, where, we, where we, you know, uh, this challenge of, you know, going the next step. Then you have the committed. The committed is come and grow. In other words, you're saying, I want to grow. I want to do more. I want to learn how to pray. I want to learn how to read my Bible better and more effectively. I want to, I want to discover my gifts and, and, and how God's, what God's doing in my life so I can, I can, I can uh, use that and, and fulfill my purpose. It's, and, and, and so that's, that's an important part of learning, of, of growing, saying I want to go. And, in, and that would mean taking like a growth track. We say that where we help you to discover your gifts. And then lastly, the, or the, not lastly, this is the fourth one, though, is this core. That's another level. That's come and serve. Come and serve. And, in the, and what that means is you're saying, hey, it's not just about me. I care about other people. I want to make a difference in other people's lives. I'm here to serve. And so if that means I hold somebody's baby while, that, while the mother can listen to the gospel presentation, or I can serve in some way, I want to do that because I want to make a difference. 
And so that's come and serve. That's a whole nother level. And that's why we talked, I talked earlier about worship one, serve one. That's part of what that means. And if you talk to people that do that, and we have a lot of people in our church that come to one service to worship one, and then the other one they come to serve. And you ask them which service they like the most, almost all of them will tell you, I like the one I serve at the most. Because you're utilizing your gifts and you're doing it as a team. And it's part of what we call the dream team. Now, this actually is the vision of our church. The vision of our church is to know God, to find freedom, to discover your purpose and make a difference. And each one of these represents that. This is where people know God. Here's where they find freedom in small groups. Here's where they make it, where they, where they discover their purpose in the growth track. And then they come and they make a difference on the dream team. But there's actually another level that you can go with Christ. And, and it's, it's, the, it's being commissioned. It's, in other words, it's, it's kind of tying back to that verse we were looking at where Jesus says, I want you to deny yourself, pick up your cross. Pick up your cross, which means come and die. In other words, it's not, you just, you, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a pastor or a priest. I'm not saying that. But what it does mean is you say, you know what, my whole life is for God. It's not just weekends, not just small group night. You know, my whole life, my, 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 my resources, my time, my energy, I'm living, whether it's at work or at home, even if I'm uh, at, a, at a, a sports game and I go to a tailgate party, I'm looking for, I'm sharing God. Oh, I could be on vacation. I'm living my life for God. And this, this is, so wherever you're at, see, each one of us could, you look at it, you go, yeah, that's where I'm at. And, and, and I think, the Holy Spirit is saying, I want you to go another level. Here's the guarantee that Jesus gives. He says, if you come and you, and he says, if you're just trying to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you give your life to him and for his, and for the gospel's sake, you will save it. When you decide to live for eternity, live for a different perspective, when you decide to go up a level and you go, God, I want to, I want to make a, a bigger commitment to you. God honors that. Your life will be better. It's going to, you'll, you'll have the best year you've ever had this year if you decide to, to step it up. Say, I want to go another level. And you go, well, Andy, how do you do that? Well, you do it really through a commitment. Just like Jesus. You, sometimes people go, well, I wonder what it would be like to live in Jesus's day. Listen, if, if Jesus was here or you were living in Jesus's day, Jesus would say, it's right now. Now is the moment to make a decision to step it up. And you'd you should do that before God, just you and God. So let's just take a moment. I want, to, I want to take a moment. I know we've got baptisms in a few minutes, but let's respond. Let's respond to what God is calling us because the Holy Spirit's at work in some of your lives, okay? Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Right now. Lord, we invite you right now into this place. Come, Lord. Holy Spirit, I know that you're at work drawing, some of you are saying, I'm feeling drawn to respond. How do you do that? Well, you do that by prayer. And I'm going to just invite you to pray along with me. So you see, if you're feeling a prompting, and the Holy Spirit, for some of you, it's been going on before today. There's been a prompting. God's been wanting you to, hey, I'm calling you home, calling you back. And that is not me. It's not about joining a church. It is about coming to Christ, recognizing what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. Now listen, if you are saying, that's me, you need to kind of get it in your mind. I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to get right. I'm ready to take it to the next level. I'm ready to put my faith in Christ. And you need to do that. Just like he said, without shame, you need to do it boldly, confidently, and you need to let God know. I'm ready to do that. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, just raise your hand right now where you're at. If you say, I'm ready to, to step it up. I'm ready to make a decision for Christ. Just raise your hand up boldly. Okay. Bless you. Raise it. It's not bless you. Okay. Okay, you can put your hand down. I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray for everybody. I want to pray specifically for you, though, those of you who raised your hand. Would you say, Heavenly Father, help me to deny myself, to pick up my cross, and to follow you. Give me the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. 
wash me clean. My conscience, the sins, guilt, all that washed clean. You say today, make today a day that's fresh and new for me. Now I want to pray for everyone because some of you, you need to take that next step forward and would you say, God, help me if I'm in that place where I've just come and see and it's time for me to, to get involved more and to come and join. Or maybe some of you are saying, I've already joined, but I really need to, I need to discover my gifts and how that's supposed to operate and, and then ultimately to serve. To be a follower of Christ and to come and die. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed to receive Christ, I, I, let me just say that's the most important decision. Would you, would you, I think that's amazing. We applaud that decision. I'm standing, we're standing 100% behind you as you're, as you're walking out your faith. And that's what we're here to do together. Now, the very first step that you do when you make a decision for Christ is you get water baptized. I want you to, uh, and that's here, this, this slide here, water baptism, this first step, okay? I want you to watch this video about one of the people in our church who's going to get baptized today, and then we'll look at baptism briefly, and then we'll, get ba- we'll, we'll do some baptisms, okay? Watch this. Hi, I'm Moon Ramden. The reason I'm making this decision to get baptized is because I feel in my heart that it's the next step in my spiritual journey. I've been attending Vineyard for a very long time, over 10 years. Two of my kids have been baptized here at Vineyard, along with the rest of my family. I have watched numerous baptisms and always felt the urge to get baptized, but held back, and I'm not really sure why, but I made a decision not to hold back anymore and just surrender everything to the Lord, including this decision. I've made up my mind, and this is one more step that I wanted to take in following the example set by Jesus Christ. To watch me get baptized, I invited a great deal of people. I was gonna get baptized during a missions trip in Mexico, but I decided to wait to do it here at Vineyard because I wanted to do it where all of my family had been baptized. Doing it here would allow me to share that decision with those I wanted to invite. I'm having family drive down from Maryland to share this momentous day with me, along with the missions team, my small group, and my friends and family here. Getting baptized means a great deal to me. I feel like I'm publicly declaring that I am a son of God, which I've known for a long time. I also feel that I'm surrendering a part of me that was left untouched by God. I am finally fulfilling that decision, that next step God wanted me to take. He has definitely touched my life in so many ways and is at the center of it now. So if there's anything left that is not his already, I'm making a decision to surrender it now. It also means to me that I will be a better leader of my family and lead them towards Christ, even though for quite some time they have been leading me to the Lord. So we're going to do baptisms in just a moment, and we're going to do what we call spontaneous baptisms. And the reason we do that is every time we have people that they came dry, expecting to stay dry, and they leave wet. And the reason is, is because the Holy Spirit moves on you, and God's, the Holy Spirit's always trying to get us in compliance with His Word. And sometimes we're like pre-baptized. In other words, before we made a decision as infants. And listen, here, we totally honor that. We recognize that I was baptized as an infant. But that's something my parents did. I, I mean, I, at first I kind of thought, well, I thought it was covered. But then when I looked at the Bible, you know, 27 different times in the New Testament, it says that they got baptized right after they made a decision for Christ. And so uh, if you make a decision for Jesus, you get baptized to demonstrate that. That's why you get baptized. And, and so here at the Vineyard, we, we dedicate children. We baptize believers. We baptize people once they make a decision for Christ. Let me give you three reasons why. Number one, is it said, well, here it says, those who accepted his message were baptized. So you see it, like I said, 27 times. Number one is to follow the example set by Christ. 
to follow the example. So in other words, Jesus got baptized. He didn't have to. He was sinless. But he did it. And so he set, it's a symbol. Like my wedding band here is a symbol that I'm married. The wedding band doesn't make me married. I got married. And then I put that on as a symbol that I am married. Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Christ was baptized. Listen, if it's good enough for Jesus, you, in fact, that's a, a something you can live your whole life for. If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Okay? Number two, to demonstrate my changed life. In other words, that I, when I make a decision for Christ, it's, it's real. And I'm demonstrating. I'm saying, hey, I'm, I'm serious about this. I'm serious. doesn't mean my life's perfect, and I'm still making a lot of mistakes, but I, I have, I'm walking towards this new and changed life in Christ. It says, in baptism, we show. In other words, there's nothing magical about the, the water. It's, it's hey, it's, I'm showing something. We show that we have been saved from death and doomed by the resurrection of Christ. Not because our bodies are washed clean by the water, but because in being baptized, we are turning to God and asking him to cleanse our hearts from sin. And then lastly, to declare my commitment publicly. So we declare our, our, our commitment publicly. And that's what baptism is. I mean, when we make a decision, it's kind of like me and God. But like I said, it's supposed to be declared publicly. It's not something we keep to ourselves. It's like my wedding band. I mean, wouldn't that be kind of weird as if, if every time I leave the house, I like put the wedding band down. I go out throughout the day and I come home, I put it back on. My wife's going to look at me. She's going, uh, what's going on? Right? I mean, I don't wear my wedding band for my wife. I wear it so that I let all the other women know, hey, this is taken. <laughs> you know, you can't have any of this. I know you're not thinking that, but. <laughs> it's to declare it publicly, right? I mean, this, and that's what we do when we get baptized. It's a very powerful proclamation. Jesus said, and we're going to kind of wrap it up with this last verse. He says, whoever acknowledges me, acknowledges me before man, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. I will also acknowledge him. So it's a way of us acknowledging what Christ has done. Now I said it's uh, a spontaneous baptism. How does that work? Well, we've prepared for that. So for those of you who have come and you're not, thinking, eh, I wasn't really ready for that, we have a shirt ready for you. Uh, we have a place, a changing room back there. You can go get changed. Of course, we have towels. We have hair dryers, blow dryers, all that stuff. We're ready for you, even though you might not have been ready. Because we, we want you to be right with God. We want you to make that important step. Sometimes we let pride get in the way and all these kinds of things that, you know, we think, well, maybe I'll do it later. Well, maybe you won't. And, you know, in my experience is that we either each day, daily, Jesus said, we either take a step towards him or we take a step the other way. There is no neutral ground. Daily, you're taking steps either towards him or the other way. So this is an opportunity for you to say, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it right now. I would like everybody to stand with me. All of you, would you stand? Some of those, some of you, you need to come out and come right over here and it's time for you to get baptized. Even if you weren't sure. And you want to know more about it, right over here, we, we have everything for you. Andre's right over here. He's got his hand up. You can come right over here. Okay? Some of you are not sure. Don't worry about what other people are thinking. We've got photos for you at the end. You can send to your family. You might be thinking, oh, I should wait for my family. You don't need to wait for your family. We have a little video you can send them, a photo. We're, this is your moment, okay, to get baptized. Say, I'm going to take this next step with Christ. I'm going to be a follower of Christ. And I'm serious about it. Okay, we're going to go into worship as we baptize. We put it up on the side screens. And uh, as I said, if you want to get baptized and you're ready to come right over here, we will wait for you as long as it takes for you to change and all. Okay, because this is your day. Okay. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.